Hey there, it's Toby the Great and I'm back with another video where in this one we're going to be talking about some bad code practices and designs that you should avoid. So a few months ago I did a video really similar titled The Worst Lines of Code Ever. So I guess you can consider this part two of that. And on this channel we talk about code, the tech industry as a whole, and I do some game development as well. So if this seems like your type of vibe, why don't you stick a while, subscribe, and like the video if you like this type of content. Thanks. So let's get right into it, starting with the code snippet that you see right in front of you. I'm trying to design a store in code, and one of the most important functions of a store is being able to buy items. I want my customers to be able to take a given item and the amount of money that's currently in their wallet be able to purchase said item. So looking at the flow of this function written in Java, we take in two parameters of the item and the given wallet amount of the customer. And what we'll do here is fetch the item price from this map that I have currently labeled and defined right above the function signature. And once we've retrieved that item price value, we'll compare with a wallet amount to see if the customer has sufficient funds to purchase the item and then we'll return true if they can and false if they can't. Seems like a pretty good start, right? Well, let's add a little bit more to our function here. What if I wanna keep track of the current inventory of items that we have? It might look a little like this. If you look towards the top, you've seen that I've represented our item inventory as another hash map. And what we're adding to our function here is checking to see if our item is essentially in stock. And if it isn't, we're gonna return false again, which is signaling that we can't buy the item. Else, we're going to decrement the inventory count for that specific item and basically do the same thing as before. And there, our buy item function has a bit more responsibility, but it's nothing too bad for now and it's still pretty readable. But I still want to add another feature. Now I want to add support for receipts. I want my customers to be able to get a receipt for each specific purchase they make. That might be a little more complicated. The first thing we're going to do is change the return value of our buy item function from a boolean to a receipt object as defined on the right. And then from there we add the receipt logic to the various code paths we have. So our buy item function is getting a bit large but it's still pretty readable. However, I hope you can understand where I'm trying to get at here as to why this is suboptimal code design. Let's take it one more step further. If you see here on line 21, where if the item count is less than or equal to zero, we return a blank receipt. I actually want to add a feature for restocking an item if it's out of stock at the moment, because I don't want our customers to not be able to purchase any items. We happen to have an unlimited backlog supply of items, and I can guarantee with 99% certainty that this function will always succeed. So it's fine if I just stick it in the buy items function, right? Just to save time. The answer is no. At this point, our buy item function is approaching unmaintainability with how many variables that we're just throwing in here. And more importantly, we're handling a bunch of different responsibilities that isn't assumed from the name buy items. The first thought when you hear that action is just purchasing an item, but you don't immediately think of getting a receipt or even restocking said items. So this example was meant to demonstrate the single responsibility principle, which is some fancy title in software design that means that every function or class that you create should be in charge of one part of your program. And this principle is really important for designing large scale systems, like representing an entire store in code, not only for yourself, but for other teammates that you may have that are working on and building upon features. It makes it very easy when code is laid out in such a way that one class is in charge of one specific function or one specific part of the overall program. So my take on rectifying this is taking out everything away from the buy item function that doesn't have to do with the core functionality of a customer being able to purchase an item. Handling things like customer receipts or the restocking of items has nothing to do with purchasing the actual item. So that should be handled in other functions. And this goes both ways because if you look at the return type, instead of Boolean, I have it set to void because this is an independent function that shouldn't be relied on by other functions to get their work done. Instead of returning true or false or anything at all, we're just gonna check to see if the wallet amount is enough to purchase the item. And if not, we're gonna throw an exception that has a detailed reason as to why we can't purchase the item. 
In this next example, we're going to look at these three functions that do pretty similar things and talk about the naming conventions for them. We have get the names of all items, get the prices of all items, and get the histories of all items, and that's quite a mouthful. This isn't exactly the worst coding practice, but you can imagine having to write this multiple times all over your code base. It could get pretty tiresome, so we could do better. And in this example, in an effort to be more concise, I took out all the vowels out of the function names. And now you can barely understand what they're supposed to be doing. Get item nums, get item perks, get item histers. You can barely understand it. It's worse than before, definitely, because it's unclear and ambiguous as to what exactly the responsibility of this function is. And in this third example, which I think is a bit better than the first two, it's still not exactly where we want it to be. Just look at the verbs used for the three functions. Fetch item names, retrieve item prices, get item histories. They're all returning an array of some type. So they're all pretty similar operations. So why do we have three different verbs that are all synonyms of each other? It's adding to that ambiguity factor that makes it unnecessarily vague. And I mean vague in the sense that if another developer sees this code, their first instinct might be that they're doing similar things, but fetch might be a different operation to retrieve, which might be different than get. And you don't want to have that ambiguity. So in my opinion, function name should include a verb as the first word and then a quick, concise, but informative description of what the function will be about. Now let's look at another example of a bad coding practice that does get the job done, but as you can see here, it's a bit complicated. Taking the advice from the first example, we've now separated the functionality for validating a purchase, buying the exact item, and creating a receipt. But for some reason, we have the execution of these functions ordered under a switch statement, which is wrapped by a for loop. So design like this, which actually isn't that uncommon, comes from the mentality of wanting to make sure that these functions execute in a specific order. Because as you can see here, going from zero to two, it'll, I guess, guarantee that these functions execute in order. And if you have those kinds of concerns, especially if you're dealing with things that aren't thread safe, then I think this isn't the best solution for it. In fact, what I am saying is this is just unnecessarily complicated because these functions will execute in sequence as you have them written. So there you have it, just in three lines. For the last example, I have a get item history function that retrieves a string result from an item history's hash map and does some kind of checking to see if it's no and then returns the result. So functionally, this code does seem to execute the way we want it to, but there's a few issues that are here. Fetching from a hash map, especially in a statically typed language like Java, usually shouldn't yield an ambiguous value. So this two string method that's applied to the value returned is an anti-pattern and you should avoid it. And normally it's pretty easy to avoid it because hash map types are defined at initialization. I say words like usually and normally to signify that sometimes there are weird corner cases and different kinds of uses, but they might extend past the scope of this video. But in the normal case, you shouldn't have to do something like this. So my next issue is with the if conditional on the line right after, which checks the return value of the hash map. And if that value is null, then it assigns the string null to the result variable. Not only is this weirdly hard coded, it's also unnecessary because null is a perfectly acceptable return type here. So my take on fixing this is just making this function a one liner where you return the value of item histories. And now that I see it now, it could probably be improved by adding some special exception if it turns out that the item is not in the hash map. And that's it. There go my four examples. And I know some of these may seem nitpicky, but I really want to emphasize and get this across in all of my videos that great software engineers, in my opinion, have a collaborative first mindset where they write the kind of code that's not only readable and easily understood to them, but it's also expressive and it communicates clearly all the intentions of the features and functions to everyone else, regardless of skill level. For real, I feel like if you can write the kind of code that an experienced software engineer can understand and a novice could at least gauge and kind of loosely guess the fundamentals of, then that's the best code ever that everyone should aim for. 
So that's pretty much it. If you haven't checked the first video out that I did on this topic, please do. And thanks for watching. Peace.